go in addition to it. Um, the easy way to resolve this is basically to keep all format strings, um, you know, during the technique the same size, you know, just pad them with, you know, null characters or useless characters so that when we actually attempt our exploit and append shellcode to the format string, you know, that will happen to be the same length as all our previous um, executions of the program. Um, the result of this is, you know, given two executions of a program, one to dump the stack and two if you're being really clever and just dumping all the string addresses, you basically can get all the information you need to exploit that um, function, basically. No brute forcing, just a little bit of math. Um, it's also nice because the way this current technique works, you can shrink the length of the format string so that you can fit both the format string and the shell code in, say, less than 100 bytes, which is usually pretty you know, re reasonable for, you know, any user input field, basically. Um, however, if you don't brute force, the, brute force the override address or if you don't do some math, you still have to derive, the, derive it from some other source, such as, you know, a core dump or, you know, a known location like a program link table or the detours. So demo is a good, the good heart of the talk. Um, the first tool, which should be on your DEF CON CD, um, is a proof of concept tool in Python. Um, I have instructions for running on Backtrack 4. Um, basically, it's a nice little suite for demonstrating sort of the way the attack works. Um, you know, multiple options about where you want to overwrite, where you want to put your shell code. Um, again, since the proof of concept is missing some useful things, but um, you know, those can be really easily added, um, you know, hopefully by anyone who has an understanding of this talk. So I'll demo the tool right now. Um, you know, taking our same printf function that's, we know to be vulnerable to format string attack. And, you know, just for the sake of vulnerability sync, we'll make it uh, ownable and then executable by root. So, you know, anyone will inherit those permissions. Um, I have a dummy account right now that doesn't have, that has limited permissions. Um, obviously I want to exploit this printf function, you know, gain root access. I don't want to have, actually have to do it to myself, so, um, I'm going to basically use my tool. Um, so that's a little hard to read, but basically it's just going over the options about you know, where you want the exploit to override and where you want the shell code to be. Um, but the nice thing is you don't really have to read any of that because you can just, you know, click it with the, the binary and you're in, basically. So, and the nice thing is this technique works on any you know, any similar, similar exploiting, you know, type of vulnerability, basically. The question was, would this work on a syslog thing where the output's going somewhere else? Um, this attack basically works as long as you can read the output from formal, former vulnerabilities and use those in new vulnerabilities, it's going to work, basically. Uh, the next, next code I developed, especially for DEF CON, designed to be as loud and invasive as possible, um, has been completely automated, so I sort of removed that um, reference to having to get an overwrite location. I'm, I'm using, basically, brute forcing through the stack. Um, ported both to Python and Ruby, it's under 100 lines of code, so, um, you know, hopefully if I have, a, have time, I'll go through it right now and, um, you know, talk about it a little bit. Um, basically, it does the same thing except, you know, using a brute force attack, so let me show you that as well. So again, same printf function. Um, same dummy user, different, um, different binary. 
Um, so again, you just pass it the vulnerable function as a parameter, and you get a root shell. So um, even though you can't see it right now, for example, if I exit, you see right now it's it's actually brute forcing a bunch of you know spaces trying to go through all the um, stack values until it finds it. Um, so. You know, if as long as you know, as long as it's there somewhere, you're going to get in. So if that's all that matters, you can be invasive as possible. I'll show, show the um, Ruby version does the same thing, but for those who like Ruby better, you also can get a shell. Finally, the sort of the meat of this talk. Um, you know, if you're going to have this sweet program, you might as well port it where someone can use it. Um, in this case, I've decided to move it to Metasploit, um, add it for the capability for remote exploit. Um, the, build, the usefulness of this is that, you know, you can use an arbitrary payload, anything from Metasploit. Um, you know, the code is there in Metasploit in a known location, so you know, if you want to extend, you know, your functions for another vulnerability, you can just use Metasploit for it. Um, and for this, I created, you know, a, a sample vulnerable server that basically does the same thing, um, you know, as our printf vulnerable function, except, you know, through a TCP um, connection. So let me demo that right now. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through this too much, but basically it it opens a port on four five four six, um, you know, listens forks a process for you know step for connections, um, and then it basically sends you know SN printf vulnerability right here you know back to that socket that you um, you connected to. So let me make this and go ahead and run it. So this is running on my VMware. Um, I'm going to try to exploit it from my local Ubuntu machine. Metasploit's taking a while, don't worry. That's correct. This this assumes you know this is for kind of legacy environments where a lot of those protections are non-existent. So I'm well. Well, Metasploit's loading right now. I'll go ahead and just show you that it indeed basically just you know by by piping something through netcat to that um, server and through that port, it basically does the same thing. You know, gives sort of this um, you know data disclosure. How's it going, guys? Very good. Oh, these are my uh, my coworkers from Redspin, so they're here to play Mario Kart with me, basically. They don't have any any relation to the talk whatsoever. <laughs> okay, there we go. So right now I'm going to load my um, custom uh, Metasploit module. Um, show payloads. Let's see. What do I want to exploit today? Linux x86. I'm going to go ahead and just use a reverse TCP bind shell. See are my options for this. Looks like it accepts uh, remote host, remote port, local host. So I'm going to set those. I'm 
One third in this case is my VMware machine. And 58.1 is my local machine. Um, and hopefully this will, this will work. So the nice thing is since we're brute forcing um, the stack, you know, any return address on that stack is going to give us a, a shell. In this case, it happens to be, uh, you know, six, six, you know, overwrite return addresses on the other program. So now you can shell or share a shell with your friends and family if you would so choose to. Um, and we can verify that by, you know, listing the sessions. and then send the command to them. So you can see that, you know, I compromised this application six times and, you know, got a root, you know, root access on all of them. <laughs> Looks like I'm doing really well on time, so I'm going to go through um, you know, my brute forcing code in Python. Um, hopefully you guys will get, out, get something out of it. It's only about 100 lines of code, um, four steps. So first thing I do basically is just, you know, standard, um, actually wrong one. I basically just have, you know, initialization, you know, setting up my uh, variables, defining some functions. Um, second step, I basically go through that stack dump process as I showed you before. Um, you know, I use this data basically to find, you know, an offset address um, of the found format string. The next step after that basically is, you know, I'm looking for that, the address of that format string. Um, so basically, I run another loop to find that address. And finally, when I'm actually exploiting, all I do is create the exploit string and then run through this brute forcing technique. So, you know, 68 lines of code, you know, hopefully pretty extendable, um, used on a variety of, you know, of similar instances. So hopefully you guys will find some use out of it. Uh, in conclusion, you know, format string output um, gives you any, everything you need to actually go from discovery to compromise. Um, you know, it could be completely automated as I've shown. Um, you know, they have been easy to fix. Now they're easy to exploit. Um, you know, for those who are interested in finding some of them, a good suggestion, Google code, a good dork to look for for, you know, this type of thing is um, shown there. This basically look for, um, a C language print type function, print F type function that doesn't begin with something like a constant, something that doesn't begin with something like stdin or stderr, or something that begins with a parenthesis. So hopefully something that is actually using you know a buffer, or a, um, you know a non non command line. All right, something that uses something that the user is providing in terms of a buffer, basically. So thanks. Um, hopefully the, the tools that aren't on your CD will be put on Redspin and DEF CON shortly, Monday, I'm hoping. Um, I'm hoping that the Metasploit module will also be there as soon as I talk to those responsible for weird auto format string stuff. Um, you can contact me. Otherwise, you know, shouts to all the people at Shellfish and my uh, people playing Mario Kart with me. Um, questions, Mario Kart, hopefully, looks like we have plenty of time, but hopefully we'll be in another room if you don't have any right now, so. Can you, can, can you repeat that one more time, please?